Hello and welcome. Thank Hello. you for coming. <laughs> um, I'm Candice Vogler. I'm going to talk about uh, reason and the Freudian unconscious. This is a tiny little piece um, at the very beginning of a huge project I'm doing with my colleague Jonathan Lear about psychoanalysis and ethics. So this is just a starting move in a big thing. I hope it's all right. Okay. According to a venerable philosophical commonplace, reason sets human beings apart from other animals. We are the essentially rational animals. Our intellects are oriented to truth. In practice, we pursue good and avoid bad. And not only are we so inclined, but we also are conscious of ourselves as directed to the true and the good. The direction required by theoretical reason on the one side, practical reason on the other. That's the idea anyway. But if you follow current events or politics or lose sleep over the doings of family members or notice how hard it is to make the small changes that will make all the difference in your life, you might think this is how the rational animals do it. I mean, it doesn't seem to help much to suppose that, you know, although we struggle, at least our excellence has its home in reason, it comes from reason, the things that are most wonderful about us. Um, I mean, unfortunately, our folly looks to have a similar source. Consider other mammals, at least other mammals whose lives have not been too twisted by human interference, eat when they are hungry, sleep when they are tired, care for their young in the way required to equip the young to care for themselves and for the next generation, notice the world around them, and keep track of each other and the other animals in the vicinity very effectively. What is ordinary for our fellow mammals counts as a notable achievement for us. While it's true that we enjoy the extraordinary fruits of collective works of reason every day, our capacity for rational reflection and invention brings trouble. Sometimes we think too much. Sometimes we rush ahead when the occasion calls for reflection. Sometimes we ruin our health worrying over what might happen next or over what we did in the past. Sometimes we tie ourselves up in knots, seeking the approval of strangers while taking our loved ones for granted. Sometimes we freeze up at exactly the moment when we need to act. Sometimes we go and go and go, terrified at the prospect of slowing down. And even if things are going tolerably well, and even if an adult is reasonably active, secure, and content, she may well find herself stepping back, sort of blinking over how hard she has worked, how tightly she has been gripped by things that apparently had so little to give her. It is strangely easy for many of us to recognize something of ourselves in Swan's Lament from Marcel Proust's novel. Quote, to think that I've wasted years of my life, that I've wanted to die, that I've had my greatest love for a woman who didn't please me, who wasn't my type." Yeah. Close quote. Only a rational animal can have a moment like that. <laughs> now, the very philosophers who assure us that reason is our best feature are not insensitive to such things. Immanuel Kant, for instance, pointed out that instinct seems to make better provisions for an animal's preservation and flourishing than reason ever could, and that among rational animals, those less inclined to thinking seem to fare better than the more thoughtful among us. Quote, the more a cultivated reason engages with the purpose of enjoying life and with happiness, so much the further does a human being stray from true contentment. And from this, there arises in many 
a certain degree of misology, i.e. hatred of reason, since after calculating all the advantages they derive, they still find that they have in fact just brought more hardship upon their shoulders than they have gained in happiness, and that because of this they eventually envy rather than disdain the more common rung of people who do not allow their reason much influence on their behavior." Close quote. Philosophers have various ways of addressing the special challenges faced by the rational animal. Kant, for example, appears to have embraced what Matthew Boyle calls an additive theory of human reason. According to additive theories, human beings perceive and want things just like other animals, but have, in addition, a reasoning faculty added on to mental life charged with monitoring and regulating desires and experiences. One enormous advantage of additive theories of reason is just this. They seem to explain why relatively fortunate human beings, people who are not starving, desperately ill, friendless, or caught up in some regime that gives them very little scope for choice about how they will live, for instance, find it hard to order their lives. Widespread human failure to show the good sense one finds in other mammals looks this way on additive theories. We suffer from the distorting, confusing pall of reason slapped on top of an otherwise coherent and intelligible animal psyche. The reason part of the mind finds itself at odds with the animal part and the result may be tragic, comic, or simply uninspiring, depending upon how serious the disorder turns out to be and how much is at stake in some situation. To suggest that reason does not command the whole of human mental life is not especially startling. Additive theories offer a kind of account of this, and such theories of reason underlie a lot of work in contemporary philosophical psychology. But there are good grounds to doubt that an additive theory can be right. Boyle raises two objections to the view. First, if the animal part of the mind is as alien to reason as the additive theorist suggests, it is very hard to see how our animal, animal impulses and perceptions could obtrude in the way required to support judgment or give us reasons to act. Some of our desires do give us reasons for acting, at least they seem to. Some perceptions give us reason for thinking that things are this way or that. Neither perception nor desire could play these roles if they were not themselves permeated by reason. Basically, only a mental state with conceptual content, that is, one with the stuff of reason in it, can provide reasons. That's how it works. The second objection Boyle raises for additive theories concerns the unity of the human mind. He writes, quote, What I am calling the unity problem is a difficulty about how to account for the intuitive idea that the same subject is both a certain animal and a subject who thinks. The animal is supposed to be subject of various perceptions and desires. The thinker is supposed to be the subject of various reflective thoughts. Is the very same subject the locus of all these activities? That is, of course, what everyone wants to say. No additive theorist would want to claim that an I that thinks stands over against an it that perceives and desires. But given how the additive theorist conceives of our powers of perception and desire, it is not clear how the unity of this subject is secured. Close quote. Boyle rejects the additive account of human reason in favor of what he calls a transformative account, 
a view that he finds in Aristotle, Aquinas, and some contemporary philosophers of mind. <coughs> Excuse me. On the transformative understanding of human reason, our perceptual experiences and desires are inflected by reason, even when we are suffering from illusions, and even if we find ourselves drawn to things that are not good. After all, it is because even false impressions and misguided desires come to us made for rational scrutiny that we're capable of finding them dubious in the first place. Part of what motivates the transformative account of reason is the way that mental states, perceptions, for example, or desires, find their place in larger patterns of rational mental activity. If I am in the study and smell something burning, my perceptual experience alerts me to what's going on around me. Did I remember to turn off the stove, I think, heading for the kitchen? My concern is caught up in a rational pattern involving my memory of having made a cup of tea, my knowledge about stoves, my understanding that the smell of something burning in an apartment with no fireplace is reason enough to stop whatever I was doing and head for the most likely source of the smell immediately, and so on. We can't even attribute a contentful mental state to someone without implicitly attributing a whole web or network of rationally articulated, interrelated mental states to that person, as the philosopher Donald Davidson argued in the latter half of the 20th century. This insight provides some background support for a transformative theory of reason. But now notice that Boyle's phrase for the view that can't be right an I that stands over and against an it could serve as shorthand for the classic Freudian view of the mind. In Freudian psychoanalysis, the id, the s, the sa, the it, um, isn't the seat of you know, animal experience and appetite but rather of all too human unconscious mental activity. And the ego, the ich, the I, is in part at least a self-conscious seat of thought, feeling, and perception standing over and against unconscious mental activity and material. So it looks like the view of the human mind put to rest by strong arguments for a transformative theory of reason returns with a vengeance in psychoanalysis. And there is a sense in which that's true. The sort of mental content that becomes the stuff of psychoanalytic work does not operate in the way that we imagine the stuff of rational action and reflection does. I mean, here's a partial list of some ways in which the kind of mental content at issue in psychoanalysis unconscious mental content brought to light somehow in psychoanalysis looks to be opposed to reason. A, one, unconscious mental activity does not obey the kinds of strictures that govern rational thought in the way that most philosophers understand that term. An unconscious content can contradict both the contents of self-conscious judgment and other aspects of unconscious content without thereby creating a difficulty. The unconscious can tolerate contradictions. We're not supposed to be able to do that self-consciously. Although psychoanalysis teaches that unconscious mental activity involves both a kind of meaningful combination of ideational elements and various ways of breaking apart ideational elements, the composition and splitting of unconscious content does not take the form of inferential articulation as these would be understood in uh, an elementary logic class or something. The associations and dissociations of ideational content are neither governed in any straightforward way by ordinary semantic considerations nor is it easy to find a straightforward syntax of the unconscious, the Freudian unconscious. 
Although an analysand can become, okay, here's another point, another way. Although an analysand can become aware that she harbors unconscious anger, aggression, wishes, and the like, she cannot simply express these states in the way that she can express conscious emotions, desires, and impulses. My colleague David Finkelstein has studied this a lot. And also due to my colleague, to say that I unconsciously believe that my mother hates me normally carries the implication that my mother does not, in fact, hate me. You don't say, I unconsciously believe it's autumn. No, that's not what you say. <laughs> you say it's this autumn. You can tell changes in the air. Okay. Um, next, acting on the basis of unconscious impulses is as much a matter of acting out as it is anything else, and as such will tend to be disturbing to anyone who lets herself notice that she's acting out in this way. We're good at keeping this from ourselves. More generally, when material that psychoanalysis treats as the stuff of unconscious mental life obtrudes in daily life, it is often experienced by the subject as not making much sense. One of the hallmarks of the experience is finding oneself strange to oneself. That's not supposed to be how things go when we're like in the grip of reason. It's all supposed to feel familiar and comfortable. In short, where the Freudian unconscious is concerned, mental states do not seem to interact in a way that provides direct reasons for action or solid grounds for judgment. And because of this, some philosophers have doubted that I and my unconscious are, in any interesting sense, one and the same subject. There's a big philosophical literature about the inner homunculus that is my unconscious. Okay. That's why Boyle's arguments don't seem to find a point of leverage when the Freudian unconscious is under discussion. But Boyle seems distant from psychoanalysis primarily because of the kind of picture of reason that has become second nature in philosophical work on self-consciousness and reflection. And as near as I can tell, there is no reason to saddle Boyle with these kinds of philosophical fantasies about reason. He doesn't need to accept them. He's, um, Boyle is a philosopher at Harvard. He's very, very good, um, also very friendly to psychoanalysis. Okay. Instead, it's tempting to pause at this point and think about that picture of how reason is supposed to work in self-conscious reflective thought. It's tempting to press on that picture, the one in which rational self-governance is so perfectly realized that I only want what is actually good for me, that all my judgments have the backing of strong evidence and sound argument, that I only love what there is reason to love, only fear what is objectively alarming, in general, that I do all and only the things that I should do, feel all and only the things that I should feel, say all and only the things that I should say, and think all and only the things that I should think. I think that's what some of my colleagues think a good world would be. Um, now, I expect that a world in which such a condition was the ordinary lot of human beings would also be a world that could not have produced anything like Proust's novel, or Shakespeare's plays, for that matter, or most of the kinds of questions that animate a great deal of humanistic inquiry. They just, where would they be? Um, okay. Um, so on an occasion like this one, it's very tempting to start poking at this kind of picture about what reason is like. Now, rather than attack 
this, um, for some philosophers, seductive ideal of rational self-governance directly, however, I'm going to turn to a little tiny bit of psychoanalytic material with an eye toward opening a discussion of the place of reason in it. I do not pretend to close the discussion in the next, like, 20 minutes. This is so. If there is reason in the step of psychoanal psychoanalysis, then this all by itself suggests that the standard view of the nature and scope of human reason is too narrow. That's where I'm headed in the rest of this talk, and I'll get there by drawing a tiny bit from Freud's discussion of Little Hans. You may not remember Little Hans. He doesn't get as much airplay as like Rat Man or Dora or anything like that. Um, as psychoanalytic case studies go, I mean Freud's anyway, Little Hans is basically a mess. Okay? What we have is primarily a set of notes about what a little boy did and said between the ages of three and a half and five. Notes prepared by the boy's father, who was strongly influenced by Freud's work. This knit together with some remarks about these notes by Freud. Now, it's not clear what you can conclude from this. <laughs> um, but for all that, little Hans is pretty great. And the drama organized around his wee-wee maker is lovely. I think. Um, but, you know, th th this case study does not give us a record of psychoanalytic speech produced in session with a proper analyst, much less, and I mean, not even a record produced by someone who was not himself a principal player in the analysis daily life. <laughs> because it's his father who's doing this, and he's in the company of the child all the time. I mean, the father even brought Hans to Freud at various points. So there's all these understandings of what Dr. Freud is good for and how he helps daddy help me all the way through poor, poor little Hans's world. Um, <laughs> the boy's mother, in the meanwhile, apparently got the boy to stop touching himself in bed by actually saying that he'd lose his penis if he didn't stop. She was also a student of Freud's work. <laughs> <laughs> Thought this will weigh with him. Um, still, um, for all these <laughs> minor flaws, <laughs> 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 sorry, um, <laughs> this is the case study that set some of the basic terms for psychoanalytic work on phobia, which isn't as well discover, dis discussed as, as other forms of hysteria in Freud or elsewhere, um, in, in much the way that Ratman, the more famous guy in the pair, set some of the basic terms for psychoanalytic work on obsession. And Little Hans is also a study in anxiety. Anxiety, in turn, is, as near as I can tell, what makes the motor of unconscious mental activity run in psychoanalysis. So the extreme and total focus on anxiety is helpful. Okay, for those of you who don't have little Hans vividly right before your mind, to make a long and convoluted story short, little Hans became terrified of horses. So, I mean, this is in Vienna in the days when there's horses in the street all the time, right? So terrified that he couldn't go outside unless he was with his mother or father. In the course of developing and somehow overcoming the phobia, Hans's parents had, uh, you know, while that was all going on, as a kind of family project, actually, Hans's parents had a second child, a little girl who's called Hannah in the story. Hans's fa father told a tale about a stork bringing Hannah when Hans, alarmed by the cries of his mother in labor in her bedroom, by the appearance of the doctor at the door and the removal of a lot of blood-stained material from her room the night Hannah arrived, asked about the events that surrounded the arrival of his new baby sister. Hans also played horses with other children, engaged in speculation about his own and other children's genitals, took a lively interest in the little girls who were his cousins, had the unhappy experiences associated with his mother refusing any longer to be undressed around him, 
and let him cuddle up with her whenever he liked, and so on. All kinds of events in the life of little Hans from three and a half to five. Freud makes several observations about Hans's trouble with horses. First, having named Hans's problem an anxiety hysteria, Freud writes, quote, anxiety hysterias are the most common of all psychoneurotic disorders. But above all, they are those which make their appearance earliest in life. They are par excellence the neuroses of childhood. When a mother uses such phrases as that her child's nerves are in a bad state, we can be certain that in nine cases out of ten, the child is suffering from some kind of anxiety or from many kinds at once." Close quote. Turning to Hans's specific complaint, Freud stresses that Hans's difficulty is at once diffuse and wide-ranging, even though it's, fortunate, it's focused on the danger of seeing a horse. Quote, his father's investigations may have been without success at some points, but it does no harm to make acquaintance at close quarters with a phobia of this sort, which we may feel inclined to name after its new objects. For in this way, we get to see how diffuse it really is. It extends onto horses and onto carts, onto the fact that horses fall down and that they bite, onto horses of a particular character, onto carts that are heavily loaded. I will reveal at once that all these characteristics were derived from the circumstance that the anxiety originally had no reference at all to horses, but was transposed onto them secondarily and had now become fixed upon those elements of the horse complex which showed themselves well adapted for certain transferences. We must specially acknowledge one most important result of the boy's examination by his father. We have learned the immediate precipitating cause after which the phobia broke out. This was when the boy saw a big, heavy horse fall down. And one, at least, of the interpretations of this impression seems to be that emphasized by his father. Namely, that Hans, at that moment, perceived a wish that his father might fall down in the same way and be dead." Close quote. Okay, the term transferences in the remark has to do with substitutions and displacement of something from one item, one image or phrase or impression, to a next and a next. The whole bundle, however terrifying, is somehow also protective. Pause here for a moment and notice that it actually is frightening to see a horse fall down. It's not like the kid is wrong about this. Ordinarily, I think it's frightening to see any creature fall down. Um, it makes a kind of little break in the ordinary flow of moving around in the world with other mammals that tends to produce an isolated bit of content, an image of the horse falling down, the sight, the sounds, and so on. The world gives little Hans an isolable bit of ideational content, the image of the horse falling down. There are already many things associated with horses in his experience. He has many past contacts with horses. He has fun pretending to be a horse and play with his friends. He notes the color of the horse at the, at the place they go in the, in the country that might bite you. It's a white horse, and he thinks it looks like his father. And a general sense of unimpeded movement associated with horses. They run, they move. The image of the horse falling down gets charged with many other bits of content in such a way that little Hans can't move. He really is sort of stuck, confined by the phobia. The horse comes to function as something that can stop Hans, prevent him from going around by himself, require him to be right beside his father or his mother when he ventures into the street. And the horses in the street have various impediments that Hans always notices, things that Hans interprets as muzzles, which may have been bridles or may have been feed bags, and as glasses, but glasses that function to block vision rather than enable it, sort of bits, reins, harnesses, 
and so on that attach horses to carts, all these things Hans noticed very carefully. Hans's mind uses the horse image and all that it can collect in various ways. The associations and ideational content are not the kinds that we demand from self-conscious thinking. That doesn't mean they don't make sense, actually. Neither does it mean that we can't get a feel for a young mind busily working with everything it absorbs by matching ideational content to affective states and experiences. Perceptions and desires are interacting here in unexpected and creative ways, of course, but they are interacting. Moreover, it is one and the same young person, little Hans, who is working with his experiences and impulses throughout. There's unity of subject all the way through little Hans's story. It's obvious that the workings of the mind are not following the kinds of pathways that philosophers usually trace out when they talk about conceptual content. But it's equally obvious that the associations and splits in content are conceptual. It's not in the usual way. He's working with meaning, not in the way one works with meaning in self-conscious, reflective, critical thought, but in ways that nevertheless make sense. Over the course of the case, Hans undergoes a series of other experiences that Freud takes to be more important than horses in thinking through the phobia. Here's Freud's summary. Hans gave up masturbation and turned away in disgust from everything that reminded him of excrement and of looking at other people performing their natural functions. This is a reversal from a curiosity he had shown about these things earlier. But these are not the components which were stirred up by the precipitating cause of the illness, his seeing the horse fall down, or which provided the material for the symptoms, that is, the content of the phobia. This allows us, therefore, to make a radical distinction. We shall probably come to understand the case more deeply if we turn to those other components which do fulfill the two conditions that have just been mentioned. These other components were tendencies in Hans which had already been suppressed and which, so far as we can tell, had never been able to find uninhibited expression. Hostile and jealous feelings toward his father and sadistic impulses, premonitions, as it were, of copulation, towards his mother. These early suppressions may perhaps have gone to form the predisposition for his subsequent illness. These aggressive propensities of Hans's found no outlet, and as soon as there came a time of, pr of privation and of intensified sexual excitement, they tried to break their way out with reinforced strength. It was then that the battle which we call his phobia burst out." Close quote. And then Freud goes on to speculate about how this erupting horse phobia served Hans. Quote, during the course of Hans's anxiety hysteria, a part of the repressed ideas in a distorted form and transposed onto another complex forced their way into consciousness as the content of the phobia. But it was a decidedly paltry success. Victory lay with the forces of repression and they made use of the opportunity to extend their dominion over components other than those that had rebelled. This last circumstance, however, does not in the least alter the fact that the essence of Hans's illness was entirely dependent upon the nature of the instinctual components that had to be repulsed. The content of his phobia was such as to impose a very great measure of restriction upon his freedom of movement, and that was its purpose. It was therefore a powerful reaction against the obscure impulses to movement, which were especially directed against his mother. For Hans, horses had always typified pleasure in movement. But since this pleasure in movement included the impulse to copulate, the neurosis imposed a restriction on it and exalted the horse into an emblem of terror. Thus it would seem as though all that the repressed instincts got from the neurosis 
was the honor of providing pretexts for the appearance of the anxiety in consciousness. But however clear may have been the victory in Hans's phobia of the forces that were opposed to sexuality, nevertheless, since such an illness is in its very nature a compromise, this cannot have been all that the repressed instincts obtained. After all, Hans's phobia of horses was an obstacle to his going into the street and could serve as a means of allowing him to stay at home with his beloved mother. In this way, therefore, his affection for his mother triumphantly achieved its aim. In consequence of his phobia, the lover clung to the object of his love, though to be sure, steps had to be taken to make him innocuous. The true character of a neurotic disorder is exhibited in this twofold result. Okay, that's what Freud does with it. Um, uh, Jacques Lacan does something a little bit different in, with the same material. Um, for Lacan, what's really interesting uh, about the horse phobia is that um, it allows Hans to prop up his father, not find a way of accessing his mother. <laughs> Um, his father is uh, not a, an entirely beautifully realized <laughs> figure of authority <laughs> over life and anything. I mean, he even has to call on Dr. Freud to help with his own son. I mean, and uh, so the father is in various respects deficient. For Lacan, part of what Hans is doing by having his phobia is protecting his father. By coming up, by making there be a thing that he holds to be absolutely huge and terrifying and that becomes identified in various complicated ways with his father, he's able to try to make, help his father be more big and powerful and terrifying by being terrified of horses. Understanding it. So it's like a little crutch He's propping up his dad. Um, I actually, you know, I don't know what you can say because the case material is so troubled. Um, but uh, Lacan has this much going for him. Dad had trouble. <laughs> it's really clear that dad had trouble and it's pretty clear from exchanges between Hans and his father that Hans was busy trying to somehow find a way <laughs> to sort of get dad to be in the world with him. So there's that much that you can pull, I think, from the case history, even as corrupted and unreliable as such a case history has to be, okay? Whichever way you go, the neurosis is making possible a kind of compromise that's to the advantage of the boy. Okay. Now, a phobia is by definition an irrational fear. That's how you know that something's a phobia. It's because it's out of proportion and not reasoned and so on. But a psychoanalytic account of a phobia depends upon treating the phobia as based in the subject's experiences and desires and as, in a strange way, an instance of the subject's mind taking care of itself. There's something overwhelming in the vicinity. The phobia becomes a way of containing, holding, and handling and focusing what would otherwise be completely overwhelming. If there wasn't this kind of method in the madness psychoanalytic experience teaches us to read, there would be no way of psychoanalyzing content. What you do when you psychoanalyze content is look for these kinds of complicated interrelated patterns and how they are in fact serving the unity and health of the overall mind, the single mind, which is part of the reason that trying to split the mind 
not only doesn't help you make sense of the Freudian unconscious, but renders it completely opaque. So you can't see how it helps anymore because you don't see what it's helping. Okay. The work of giving a solid and detailed account of the place of reason in unconscious mental activity is huge and extremely difficult. But we can't so much as begin that work without noticing that psychoanalytic content bears the imprint of reason throughout, which may just be a way of saying that it is, after all, mental content. Fully comprehending this, of course, will require both broadening our sense of the scope of reason and deepening our understanding of what a transformative theory of reason has to offer an essentially rational animal. Thank you.